Um, and as always, a big thank you to the Laura Library. They're very supportive of these types of discussions and thank you for attending tonight. Um, if you've been to any of my lectures before, I always like to start by this, uh, this quote from uh, H.L. Mencken, which says, for every complex problem, there is an answer that is clear, simple, and wrong. Um, what we find is a lot of times, you know, people will say, all you have to do is blank way. Um, and in any industry I've ever worked in, that answer is always wrong. Uh, because there are very nuanced issues that we're discussing that we have to solve problems for, and there's really no simple or clear um, answer. And there is there is a variety of thoughts and discussions, and that's what we encourage during these uh, presentations. We want to hear what you think. If you have a question, if you have a thought, please share it. Um, so our agenda for tonight, we're going to uh, talk about the invasion. So we're going to do the whole thing from, from day one to the second year of action, the invasion. We're going to talk about one year in, two years in. We're going to talk about why we should care. Um, and we're going to talk about some future options that uh, Ukraine and Russia have. So this is a video I want to just start with to summarize the two years. Two years of brutal war in Ukraine, a country forever scarred and a frozen deadly stalemate. Eastern Europe fears Putin's next steps and U.S. abandonment. It is not by accident that the closer you are to Russia, the, the, the more you're spending on defense. And the death of Alexei Navalny, the U.S. and Navalny's family blame President Vladimir Putin. If this is true, I want Putin and his entire entourage to know that they will bear responsibility for what they have done with our country, with my family, and with my husband. This is PBS News Weekly. I'm Nick Schifrin. It has been two years since Russia launched a full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Many in Washington feared Kyiv would fall in four days. Today, Ukraine still stands, but bears the burden of Russia's total war. <laughs> In two years, countless wives, now widows, sons, now orphans. The dead stolen of their dignity and 10 million forced to flee their homes. The largest refugee crisis since World War II. Everyone, everywhere, carries the war's scars. And so Ukraine fights. 300,000 soldiers are determined, but exhausted, outmanned, and increasingly outgunned. In some areas, for every artillery shell they fire, Russian soldiers fire 10. Two years ago today, before the full-scale invasion, Russia occupied 7% of Ukraine. On March 22nd, 2022, Moscow expanded control to 27 percent. Ukraine has won back about half that newly captured territory, but Russia still occupies 18 percent. Recently, Ukraine pushed the Russian Navy further back into the Black Sea, increased exports, and now increasingly threatens occupied Crimea. But it recently lost the eastern city of Avdivka. The Russian military has momentum as Ukraine waits for U.S. aid, without which senior U.S. officials fear Ukraine will lose. To take stock of where the war... Okay. So that actually goes on for 26 more minutes. It's on PBS if you want to check it out. Um, but I didn't want to just let them talk, or us to talk. So if you've been to any of my lectures before, I never discuss foreign policy without maps. Um, this, is this is the most updated map. Uh, that the Institute for the Study of War publishes to track everything uh, as of Sunday. And I don't think anything major has happened since then. So uh, it's important to note the PBS uh, footage said Russia at one point controlled 27%. Ukraine pushed them back. It's about 18, 19% now, maybe 20% depending on the day. Um, this area and this area, this is Crimea, this is Donetsk area. So these, this area was actually the ethnically Russian region that initially this all started, right? And I'm not talking 2020, I'm talking like 2009, right? They're ethnically Russian. Obviously you can see it borders Russia. Um, so being ethnically Russian, they actually do identify as Russian, but they also identify as Ukrainian. So they speak Russian. They may have Russian customs, they may have Ukrainian customs. So 
that separatist uh, activity started quite a long time ago, consider. Uh, Crimea was uh, annexed in 2014. Um, and then the rest of the area is basically what uh, is, is very important to pay attention. And I have other maps to, to discuss. Um, take note that Kiev is basically on the left uppermost area over there. So it's still away from the front line. Um, and some of these reds we'll, we'll discuss more in detail. And this is not a military strategy presentation, but uh, those are basically dug in defenses. That, that's what it's supposed to represent. So quick history and geography again. Uh, this map is important because these are all the Soviet, former Soviet blocs. So all these countries at some point, you can argue were part of Russia at some point, right? Up to 1992, that, that area. This is Crimea. This is the Sea of Azov. This is the Black Sea. Very important strategically for commerce, extremely important for commerce to the entire world. And I mentioned that because we'll talk about that a little bit later too. Um, so that's kind of the history and the geography. What were the reasons for invasion? Um, there are reasons that Putin stated. There are reasons that other people will talk about, you know, the Putin wanting to expand different ethnicities, different, you know, possibly religions, cultures coming together. I don't really, again, if you've been to any of my lectures, I don't buy any of that stuff. Anything foreign policy related comes down to basically power and money. Everything else are tools that people, dictators usually, use to justify actions taken in power and money. We'll talk about that later. Um, so the, the pretext to war for, for Putin was kind of nonsensical. Um, he talked a lot about Ukraine being full of Nazis and then basically committing genocide against the Russian ethnic population. Um, you know, the, the president of Ukraine was Jewish, you know, to say, you know, pres uh, it's being led by Nazis, you know. Um, and unfortunately, you have to address things like that, even though if it's nonsensical, you have to address. It. Uh, Putin exaggerated the NATO threat. Again, that's a powerful tool to do. When you have an outside invader, um, you know, people tend to unite and favor your actions to destroy them. Um, of course, we know the opposite was true, but now the opposite, the actual truth has happened. Finland is now part of uh, NATO, which was not intending on at all. And Sweden is in the process. The only holdout is the uh, country of Hungary uh, under Viktor Orban, and hopefully that'll, that'll pass as well. Um, you know, exaggerating Ukraine's desire to become a nuclear weapon. If nuclear uh, weapons had been in Ukraine, um, people wouldn't invade them because we, they would be afraid to. So um, did they have aspirations? Probably not. I don't think uh, Ukraine was in any position economically to pursue nuclear weapons. But again, that was good uh, propaganda to feed the Russian people and justify uh, the invasion. And then the false flag operations is something we see with Russia a lot. And I'm talking from early 19th, uh, 20th century. Uh, planting false flag operations like, oh, this group of people uh, attacked this Russian village and killed everybody. So we have to, that's a false flag you're pl planting and then you're gonna invade and sa save the rest of the people. Um, Russia did that with Georgia, they did it with Chechnya, they did it with Crimea. It's kind of, a, it's a playbook that Russia has. Um, it's well known and the intelligence community credits the Biden administration early on for declassifying a lot of that intelligence to say, hey, this is what Russia is doing. They're planting false, they're doing false flag operations. Um, so they wanted to be uh, clear about that. Did it stop Russia? No, they still went on. Um, well, dictators usually have very little consequence to their actions. So I've actually updated this uh, checklist since I spoke last. Um, so what did Putin want? He wanted to reach Kiev quickly and install a pro-Kremlin government. Didn't happen, can't check that off. Uh, he wanted to secure the separatist regions. Very nice check mark there. These are the separatist regions. They're done. They're very well in Russian hands. Um, create a land path to Crimea. So he already had Crimea. This was the only way he could get to Crimea before. Now he has a land path 
to get to Crimea. We, it was arguable that that was one of his logical goals. Uh, to destabilize Europe, I didn't check that off. I could, I could do a half check mark. Um, he did destabilize Europe uh, when it came to, during the earlier parts of the invasion because of energy. Um, but Europe has been able to diversify uh, from energy resources and it's been a little bit better. So not fully destabilized, but we'll see what happens in the upcoming elections. Uh, so that's why it's not checked. Um, setting an example of precedent. Again, half check mark. We'll see what happens, right? If certain countries get certain new leaders and NATO falls apart or funding doesn't get to Ukraine, that's a pretty good precedent that Putin's going to set for himself on what he can get away with. Um, and did he test NATO US resolve? He did uh, initially, great resolve, but now again, we'll see. You know, he's continuously testing the resolve of NATO and the United States. So what actually happened, uh, you, we know the Ukrainian leadership did not flee. Um, the advance was not as fast as Russia had hoped for. They had a lot of logistical issues. Uh, NATO committed to Ukraine so far. Um, and NATO united initially, we're still good, and also expanded. And I have some really good footage of that, um, of examples of, of, of NATO uh, countries that would not be doing the things that they are five years ago doing it today. So why invade? Again, you know, money and power, um, and we can break that down. There's always a land grab, resources grab. Um, there's ethnic cleansing and population conversion. Now, when I say ethnic cleansing, that doesn't always mean genocide. Um, again, the Kremlin and Putin specifically has a playbook for ethnic cleansing. Again, with Chechnya, Georgia, Crimea. Um, there are studies now comparing those to what's going on in Ukraine. What typically Russia does is go into a region. Uh, one of the first things they do, they start issuing uh, the citizens of that region Russian passports. Because at that point, they can claim these are Russian citizens. Um, clever, very deceitful, but you know that's the way it goes. Once they give them a Russian passport, um, they consider themselves Russian. And then because they're more socialist areas, everything that goes through for benefits, uh, you know, any type of welfare system, any type of uh, programs, entitlement programs, will be attached to your identification card, which is now Russian. So then they also control the benefits that you get. So this is how they generationally kind of wipe out and turn populations into, into different types of populations. And then they do things, again, this is happening in those separate regions, separatist regions. Um, they change the curriculum in schools, which happened in Chechnya, Georgia, Crimea. Um, and they're saying, hey, these are Russian citizens. We, we have to change these curriculums, right? Um, so that's the cycle, that's the playbook that Putin tends to follow, and that's exactly what's happening. So that's the ethnic cleansing portion. I really want to, and I did this before and it hasn't changed, I really want to emphasize the importance of Ukraine in as far as feeding the world. Um, the Ukrainian flag has two colors, blue and yellow. Blue is the sky. The yellow, the gold at the bottom is supposed to represent fields of grain. Um, I actually have maps. So this is corn, wheat, sunflower, and barley. Those are the leading. Uh, exports from Ukraine. These are USDA maps. This is for corn, um, which 12% comes from Ukraine. You'll see here, this is what Putin controls now. You'll see kind of the region. This is, it's here, right? And over here. So not necessarily huge corn uh, fields here, but what's very important also for Ukraine uh, what they had is, it's not just the ability to grow um, crops and the grains. It's the ability to transport. So all along this area here, there's significant transportation uh, infrastructure for this pop, uh, for this crops to come to the Sea of Azov or to come to the, the uh, Black Sea. So now, Putin controls that region too, controls that infrastructure. So grains, can no longer be transported 
to the rest of the world from here, which they were. Now they have to go through here. And of course, we know from Crimea and this land border, Putin and the Russian military can still, uh, you know, kind of uh, disrupt those operations as well. So when we look at the wheat maps, it's more significant. 5%, 7%, 6% along the same line. So Putin now controls that production. Are they producing at full capacity right now? Obviously not, because you know, a lot of those fields probably have mines and barricades and stuff to stop Ukrainian advances. But for someone of that stature to be able to control the food supply to the rest of the world and cause instability, that is significant power. And that is significant wealth. So I think you get the idea, sunflower oil, and I'm happy to share these maps with anyone who'd like them. Um, same thing, controls a good amount. And then for barley, again, significant account, amount, including uh, Crimea, from Crimea for that. And then of course we have Euro, the gas pipeline. So not necessarily for this region, but you can see how controlling Ukraine, two major, gas pipelines that go to the rest of Europe um, being impacted if you control Ukraine. Um, now, again, Europe is smart enough. They've started to diversify away. But when we talk about what other choices, why Putin might test the resolve of NATO, you know, are we going to defend Poland, Lithuania, Latvia? Those are also countries that, you know, have pipelines going through them. And it's testing our resolve, whether we're going to stand with those countries, whether they're going to be able to defend themselves. So one year in, the invasion was obviously slow. Um, the Ukrainians prepared for a counteroffensive about 13, 14, 15 months in. And now we have Russia completely dug in. And this is something we talked about uh, a few months ago. And we literally looked at the types of barricades, you know, it really does look like the first world war barricade type of style. There are trenches, there are metal barricades, there are all types of mines, and unfortunately everything is just more advanced. So why is the counteroffensive slow? That's why. Um, you would need significant forces uh, and significant technology and weaponry to try to get past those. Um, and it still would be slow. So there's no surprise that because they're dug in, um, Things are slow. The war in Ukraine is now a grinding war of attrition. It is very different from the initial stages of the war. The Russians control roughly 25% of Ukraine, and they are in the process of annexing it. Russia's effort right now is in areas like western Donetsk Oblast. The Russians have taken virtually all of Luhansk. They are now focused on pushing westward into cities like Sovyansk and Bakhmut. The way they're doing it is through a really heavy focus on artillery, uh, barrages targeting both Ukrainian military and civilian structures and then the Russians pushing into areas with dismounted infantry with some main battle tanks and other ground systems to try to gain some momentum as they move westward. And that has the strategic value of putting additional pressure on the Kyiv government. The key right now for the United States and its Western allies and partners moving forward is to help Ukraine begin to retake territory that it's lost to Russian forces and to stall Russia's forward momentum on the battlefield. And in order to do that, Ukraine needs additional types of weapons and systems and higher quality, medium to long range systems. Attackums, even longer range would be helpful as well. The Ukrainians have lost a number of combat aircraft. They need more. Ukrainians could also use help with uh, unmanned aerial vehicles like the MQ-1C, got a higher payload and a longer range. These would be extremely helpful. If the Russians aren't stalled and they continue to push forward, that they will likely be emboldened to continue to conduct operations, not just in Ukraine, but emboldened to act elsewhere. So there are strategic reasons why the U.S. need to increase not just the amount of aid, but also the type and sophistication of aid 
that's going to Ukraine. For more information, please visit CSIS.org. So that video was made about 14 months in, right before the counteroffensive kind of started. Um, it's, it's wonderful to be able to look back and see where he was right and where he was wrong. Right, wrong. Um, so he's talking about the weapons that we should be giving them. We didn't give them all those weapons. He's talking about if we don't stop them, they're going to take over more, conduct more operations in other countries, perhaps. Hasn't necessarily happened. But at this point now, we know two years in that that region is fully in Russian control. Um, except some minor areas where local partisans are fighting. Um, so this is this is another video to remember. We're still one year in. Let's see that. One, look. one year after the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the war has gone from an initial blitzkrieg operation by the Russians to try to take Kiev quickly, now to a grinding war of attrition. It is not the war the Russians wanted to have, but it's the war they've got now. War of attrition means high numbers of casualties, both military personnel and with the way the Russians fight, civilian uh, casualties as well. Russians have run out of a lot of their precision munitions. They're targeting some of the key critical infrastructure in Ukraine, electricity grids, apartment buildings, really to try to wear down the morale and just the basic living standards of Ukraine. The Ukrainians were successful in the late summer and the fall in retaking territory in the east. The Russian advances uh, were certainly thwarted by the Ukrainians. This is where Ukraine has gone, is trying to punish the Russian military and army and make it very difficult for them to take and hold territory. And what it means in practical terms is we're seeing the Ukrainians kill fairly large numbers, waves of uh, Russians. We're in a very bloody phase of the war. When the war started, the Russians have a significant material advantage. What the Ukrainians have been able to do at various periods of the war is to innovate different kinds of technologies, tactics, techniques, and procedures. A couple of examples there are the way the Ukrainians have used drones or unmanned aerial systems. These are just drones like Chinese-built DJI's Mavics, which have been very helpful to forward-deployed forces. So they're forward-deployed to spot for artillery. They're using them for information operations to download video and put them on social media. They're using them to jam Russian positions, electronic warfare. There's a range of ways they're using them in ways that haven't generally been used in the past. This is a war of survival right now, so there's a lot of initiative that is happening at the lower levels of the Ukrainian military willing to experiment. Those factors have really contributed to and sped up the innovation among the Ukrainian military. As we look into the next phase of the war, uh, there are significant risks on both the Russian and the Ukrainian side, and to what degree those two countries are willing to take those risks uh, will help outline what the future looks like. The biggest risks to Ukraine right now is that Ukraine is relying on the Western industrial base for its support of weapon systems, munitions, all of the things that are critical for an army in terms of logistics. If Ukraine was to lose a great deal of that support because the West was tired of providing it, in a war of attrition, it would probably spell a very dangerous period for Ukraine. So on the Russian side, a war of attrition, if the West continues to provide assistance, will mean larger and larger numbers of Russian casualties and fatalities. That may put some strains on Russia's political leadership. So unless the Russian army can figure out how to fight more effectively, it runs huge risks in actually being able to take and hold much ground, which means this war of attrition can be grinding on both sides. But if we do start to see the Russians push for a ceasefire, at what point do we start to see stronger public and private pushes to settle this conflict at the negotiating table rather than on the battlefield? Because if not, then what we can assume is that this war will 
uh, continue to drag on for the foreseeable future, which I think is the most likely scenario at this point. The, one of the mistakes we often make as Americans is thinking that if we are able to set back another uh, power, they will go down. If you were thinking about it in terms of us as Americans, if we were all of a sudden invaded or we had sanctions placed, what would we do? We wouldn't just sit down and take it. We would figure out ways to go around it, um, build new things in it, right? So one thing we make the mistake of is saying, oh, Russia, we had severe sanctions on them and their initial assault failed. It is not what they expected. Putin is embarrassed. That's not true at all. Um, a dictator doesn't have to answer to the people. So Putin can use, lose millions and millions of people. If he does things right, he can win you know, with just sending people to the front. Um, we've seen that he's made deals with Iran and uh, you know, DPRK to get more weapons, to get more artillery. And what you saw in that first video actually is the ratio initially after the invasion when the Russians were pushed back Ukrainians had the advantage of firepower. That's not true now. The initial video, and this is the number that's used, the artillery is 10 to one now. So clearly Russia has an advantage. So he talks about, um, you know, again, this is year in. Would you, would Putin, if you were Putin, would you sit down for ceasefire talks? Right? I wouldn't. What does he, well, he has nothing to lose and everything to gain right now. He has a very strong hold on uh, the separatist regions and more. He has a land bridge to Crimea. His navy in the Black Sea has, you know, gotten damaged, doesn't necessarily impact him. Um, so, you know, is he getting internal pressure or is he going to have an election soon where people are going to be upset? Mm, no. Um, he's even importing, uh, you know, some propaganda, some rumors, some truth. They're, you know, putting prisoners on the front line. They're getting other countries, you know, Syrian soldiers, other uh, people that Russians have fought alongside with to come to the to and fight in Ukraine. Um, so he's he's in a pretty good position as far as a dictator is concerned. Um, you know, there were questions about his health. That doesn't seem to be an issue right now. So um, that's a factor as well. So. You know, all in all, you know, he has everything to gain. A war of attrition is pretty good as long as he can wait out until our November elections. And we'll see what happens. Um, again, we'll see. No one, if, if complex issues, multiple different types of scenarios can happen, you can't really predict what people will do. But we'll talk about, I'll show another map of, you know, if we withdraw and if we don't support NATO, where else Putin can go? Okay, so uh, two years in now, we know the Ukrainian counteroffensive was slow. You can call it a failure. Um, it's pretty expected. I mean, people defended their homes, they pushed them back. Uh, if you saw in that last video, you literally see the trenches and you see, you know, concrete, metal, uh, blocks, there's mines, everything. Very difficult to push through that. And you're also, a lot of times you're doing urban warfare. I mean, they're not like huge cities like Kiev, but they're big enough where you can't just be firing at each other. Uh, by the way, you'll hear, uh, this is an old Soviet tactic that's been used for decades and decades and just Russia will not adapt to anything else. Um, the way Russia fights is they barrage with artillery, with firepower over and over and over until they feel that their target is weakened enough and then they send waves of dismounted infantry. Uh, with the barrages of rockets, there's a lot of civilian deaths. I mean, you're just targeting, you know, they're not using smart weapons here. Uh, with the infantry coming in, obviously there's going to be human waves where the infantry is done. So, He's sacrificing a lot of human beings in this type of operation. Modern warfare, we don't do that. And 
we we use some firepower, we maneuver. Um, so, and, and that's one of the goals is to reduce civilian deaths and and, and that, the impact on that. Um, so, sanctions we just talked about have they worked? No, not really. Um, and you know we can do a separate lecture on if sanctions ever work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How, how is that? Are they going to go back? What was it? Yeah, I think the thought behind that was was that you know he would you know you would diversify his ability to have access to all these both assets and people, the billionaires. Um, very soon after into the war, I mean, all the oligarchs were sitting in one room listening to him talk. Um, you know, it's something you have to do. I don't think, I don't think the real decision makers actually thought that that would, you know, shake everything. There's a very slight chance, you know, there could be a coup against Putin. Um, but, you know, again, we make the mistake of thinking these oligarchs, because they're not American, are stupid. They know what they do and they know how to hide their money. So we took a bunch of their yachts and we took a bunch of their money. Did we take all their money? No. I mean, if you have $20 billion and we take 10 of it, are you weak? No. If we take 15 billion of it, are you weak? No. I mean, so that was the thinking behind it. It's something you have to do, but you're not necessarily expecting that it'll break the camels. No. No, I mean, so, you know, I mean, we've frozen a lot of assets um, from Russia. And Russia is operating at what economists and, and thinkers call a wartime economy. Um, so they're very much a wartime economy. I mean, everything is nationalized. Um, but, I mean, they're not dying from you know, a lack of like groceries or food or anything like that. Now, can they do that for two more years, three more years? Maybe, probably not. You'll really start to see the impacts the longer this goes on and if, if we continue to support Ukraine. But again, November is an interesting timeline, um, you know, because he may not have to, um, you know, after things like this, if he does come to the table, you know, that might be one of the conditions is that certain sanctions are lifted. And again, you know, the, the gentleman asked the question, does the West have the will? Do we want to keep supporting Ukraine and putting in money? Is it worth it? Some would argue yes, some would argue no, some argue don't care. Just, just you know, let them do what they want to do. Um, so Russia's goals, we talked about ethnic cleansing. We talked about the land expansion. I think that's still the case. Um, what are Ukraine's goals? Uh, I don't think we can, we don't have to argue. One is survival. They're in an existential fight. Um, and then two of Ukraine's other goals, which we know of, are to become part of NATO and to become part of the EU. Different schools of thought on whether NATO will admit them after a ceasefire and whether EU will admit them. And of course, we're talking probably like a certain portion of Ukraine, the rest of it will belong to Russia. So uh, we have to watch out for that too. If there is a ceasefire, one of the items that's gonna be of debate is whether they're going to let Ukraine in so Russia doesn't attack the rest of NATO in a year or two without guarantees of security. But of course, Putin has said, if NATO accepts Ukraine, He's not going to accept any ceasefire and he's going to attack you. So Putin has made it clear that that is a deal breaker if Ukraine joins NATO at any point. So he's coming that as a precondition. If he does come to a negotiating table, that's a precondition. Ukraine can never join NATO. Now, will that change? Possibly. You know, you come with these types of statements to the negotiating table and sometimes you. You, you know, you use it as a bargaining chip. I'll let them join NATO. But everyone tends to agree that if we do have a ceasefire deal, Ukraine will need some type of defense cooperation agreement 
to make sure they are protected in the future, just like Finland and, and you know, Sweden and Latvia and Lithuania. Complex stuff. So I'm actually, you're kind of short on time. So, I mean, you know the counteroffensive. Um, we kind of, again, I'm happy to send these videos to you if you want. Um, it's been slow and it's been slow because of what we talked about. It's very difficult to get through these defenses, um, you know, where the Russian people, and you know, they're bringing in their logistics in these areas. They're securing their logistics. So it's very difficult to get, especially with low weapons uh, and ammunition. This is kind of, uh, so the Institute for Study of War follows us a lot. I just, I do wanna play this uh, video because I think it's very important about what started happening in January from the Russian. Hello, my name is Riley Bailey and I'm a Russia analyst at the Institute for the Study of War. Russian forces conducted the largest series of missile and drone strikes against Ukraine since the start of the full-scale invasion on December 29th and have since conducted several large strikes targeting Ukraine. The intensification of the Russian strike campaign this winter likely aims to degrade Ukrainian morale and Ukraine's ability to sustain its war effort against Russia. ISW continues to assess that any Russian effort to break Ukrainian will is very unlikely to succeed, however. Russian forces have reportedly targeted Ukraine's defense industrial base in recent strikes, likely aiming to prevent Ukrainian efforts to expand its defense industrial base to support a longer war effort. The strike packages that Russian forces have recently launched at Ukraine represent the culmination of several months of Russian experimentation testing Ukrainian air defenses. The December 29th strike represents the largest combined Russian missile and drone strike against targets in Ukraine, and Russian forces continue to diversify both the systems and tactics they use in these attacks. Ukraine lacks the number of air defense systems required to provide even coverage to all of Ukraine, and consistent Russian strikes in Ukraine likely aim in part to force Ukraine to concentrate air defense systems, protecting larger population centers far from the front line. The intensification of the Russian strike campaign likely intends in part to reapply pressure on Ukraine's limited air defense umbrella and prevent Ukrainian forces from redeploying air defense systems from the rear towards the front. Western provisions of air defense systems and missiles remain crucial for Ukraine as Russian forces attempt to adapt to current Ukrainian air defense capabilities and as Ukraine develops its own defense industrial base under the threat of Russian strikes. Thank you for listening, and please follow the Institute for the Study of War for more updates on the war in Ukraine. A few things on this. <clears throat> About a year in, um, year and a half in. They do great work, by the way. About a year and a half in, Ukraine is like, oh, we can't rely on the United States and NATO to give us weapons. Because you know elections, politics, et cetera, et cetera, and they were right. So they started getting manufacturers to come to Western Ukraine, and they started thinking about what it would take for them to build weapons, some type of weapons themselves. Again, great idea. Russians aren't dumb. The Russians started preparing packages to, you know, take out any facility that the Ukrainians might have been able to use, could use to do such a. Um, the Russians, again, you know, think about it. These are the largest airstrikes two years in after the invasion. The Russians are clearly not, you know, we can say they're running out of munitions. They still have munitions and the Ukrainians don't have enough to defend against. So they're using drones, missiles, all sorts of things to go after Ukrainian infantry. The other very important point that's being discussed here is Ukrainian will. Um, so this gentleman's opinion is that, and maybe the institutes, is that Ukrainian will will not be broken. I want to challenge that a little bit in one of the clips I'm going to play, but just keep that in mind. Um, yes, Ukraine doesn't, you know, I think everyone will agree they don't want to be invaded by Russia, but we have already seen some cracks, the president and the chief of staff, the leading general, one is kind of saying, I think we should talk about ceasefire with Putin. 
Um, the leader of the country is saying no. So there's, you know, maybe a crack there. That is a form of testing their resolve. They're achieving somewhat of an objective, unfortunately. Um, and then the other is, I actually have a video on conscription. So Ukraine is actually having a pretty difficult time with getting new soldiers conscripted into the army. That wasn't the case initially, but now it is. Uh, so a war of attrition, I think anyone who says this is not a war of attrition probably has some kind of agenda. Um, it clearly is. I mean, you can see it with the, with the physical infrastructure that's being built now. Um, no one is gaining ground. If they're gaining ground, it's days and then swaps hands. Very difficult to argue that we're not in a war of attrition. Uh, has the United States lost its resolve? Anyone want to answer that? I mean, we certainly don't have as much resolve as we did initially, as, as the entire country. Certainly certain people do cross party lines. But our resolve is being tested. Um, and I'll go into in the why we should care section about some historical examples of when this has happened before and what the consequences uh, were. Um, you know, same thing with NATO and, and uh, European Union. I can actually say the EU, no, I don't think they've lost their resolve. I think the European NATO nations have definitely not lost, lost their resolve. And I have some good videos to show you for that. Ukraine hasn't lost its resolve, but you know, things aren't looking great. They need support. There's one question we can answer very definitively here. The last one, has Putin lost his, his resolve? No. There's no one that's going to say, yes, Putin has lost his result because he hasn't. So I tried to use outside of America videos too. Wake up. It won't stop in Ukraine. It's an alarm call that's ringing across the Baltic states about neighboring Russia. From the northeast tip of Estonia, through the forests of Latvia, Bum, bum, bum. to the southeastern corner of Lithuania. Can you patrol on that, yeah. on, the, on the wood? Yeah. Many here are worried about what might follow Russia's war in Ukraine. War is already happening. Uh, so it's not a question, is Russia going to be aggressive? It already is aggressive. We take a journey along NATO's eastern border with Russia, where civilians are mobilizing to deter the threat, and ask if the UK and other allies should be doing similar. In the far northeast of Estonia lies the city of Narva. Russia sits just across the river. A crossing point called the Friendship Bridge still connects the two foes. Though unlike most of the rest of the Baltics, some of the residents here are sympathetic to Moscow. It's hard to believe that this is the very edge of NATO's border and Russia is just a few metres behind me. But any attempt by Russian forces to cross that line would trigger an Allied response. And not just a professional one. A growing number of civilians are also learning how to defend themselves. These part-time soldiers on an island off Estonia's west coast are dubbed the SAS. It stands for Saturdays and Sundays, because that's when they train. And Their commander has a warning for Moscow. It will be bloody mess if you come here. We will definitely kill as many of you as possible. And, and what's your message to other NATO countries that maybe aren't doing as much to mobilise them? Wake up. Their... It won't stop in Ukraine. If we don't stop them there, they will come further and further. Some of these volunteers joined the Defence League in part because of the war in Ukraine and they say they're prepared to fight should Russia attack. I have to take the weapon and trying to protect my family, my home. And why is your island so important to you? It's my home. It's easy. You need home, yeah. It's a good place. <laughs> Hiuma Island would be an attractive target for Vladimir Putin in any war with the West giving him the ability to control access to the Baltic Sea. 
It's the kind of threat that plays on the minds of NATO generals. The governmental this top officer the says the chance of any attack on Allied territory would grow should Russia succeed in willing. Ukraine. How seriously we take the support in Ukraine? If we give up in Ukraine, so are we giving up also our own defence? So it's, it's actually it's quite critical and should be not separated. The danger posed by Moscow is well understood across the Baltic states, where they've just agreed to build a physical defensive line along their eastern frontier. All three nations were previously part of the Soviet Union, a collective trauma. We're in Latvia, which shares a border not just with Russia, but also Belarus, which is a key Russia ally. And that's why this place is, like the other Baltic states, very, very nervous about their neighbours. They've been warning about the threat posed by Russia to the rest of NATO since they joined and were pretty much ignored up until about 2014, when Russia first invaded Ukraine. And that was the first big wake-up call. NATO belatedly started to rebuild its defences, including by sending troops to the Baltics. But then came Russia's full-scale war and an even bigger alarm bell for Europe. Bomb. 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 It prompted Latvia to reintroduce conscription. Some of these recruits are part of that programme. At a training camp, they practice how to counter an ambush with pretend gunfire and even an imaginary grenade. This 18-year-old is a voluntary conscript. I think that every man in the world needs to at least try military life. The main aim of this expanding force is to deter an attack. I visited our troops and there. It's a threat Latvia's foreign minister underlined as he too championed the merits of conscription at a recent security conference. War is already happening. Uh, so it's not a question is Russia going to be aggressive? It already is aggressive. The point of the draft is to uh, beef up capable and equipped and trained reservists. And do you think it would make a difference if Britain sort of started doing conscript, for example? Uh, I think it would make a difference if any uh, uh, European country, and of course the larger countries, it would make a bigger difference. But the UK's Defence Secretary is against the idea of training up any citizen army. Everyone knows that in a wartime, First World War, Second World War scenario, of course countries have to make other arrangements. That's not the position we're in now. We have absolutely no plans to, to do that now. Yet perhaps lessons can be drawn from Latvia, where conscription is about so much more than guns and uniforms. I think that the most important thing is to awaken the desire to protect and defend your country, to awaken the patriots in them so that they have the courage to stand up against the enemy if needed. Driving through the Baltics, the sense of unity is clear. Our final stop is the southwest corner of Lithuania, which borders Kaliningrad, a heavily fortified Russian exclave that also sits next to Poland. The three territories are connected by a, an area called the Suvalki Gap, which also borders Belarus, a key Russian ally. And the thinking by NATO officials is that should Moscow seize the Suvalki Gap, it could effectively cut off access for NATO to all three Baltic states, so it's seen as a real choke point. But the crossing here between Lithuania and Kaliningrad is also an important transit point. The only way trucks can travel by road to the Russian mainland is through NATO territory and then into Belarus. The same's true for people. Passports are checked. It's orderly, not hostile. But the fence that divides the two sides is closely monitored. The white post marks out Lithuania, red and green for Russia, with a river running in between.
the Lithuanian border guards that we've been with said that they patrol on the other side of the fence but on this side of the river all the way along this line looking out for any kind of suspicious activity about two or three times a year people try to cross this border illegally and they are then caught there are cameras operating 24 hours a day and also patrol towers that again scan the area looking for anything out of the ordinary. Lithuania's president summed up this region's response to the looming threat next door. All Baltic countries, Poland and other countries of the eastern flank of the NATO uh, do a lot in order to use all the possibilities of collective defense system uh, called NATO but we also do a lot individually by increasing our defense spending, by closely cooperating with our neighbors, and my country is especially active in this field. It's why citizens in Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania are preparing for a war they hope never to fight. But their ability to deter Russia may depend on whether other allies follow suit. Deborah Haynes, Sky News, the Baltics. No, we don't need conscription. We're not thinking about it right now. So that should put in perspective, you know, they're not all the NATO countries, not all countries have lost their result. Those are pretty new images to see of civilians in Latvia, Estonia, you know, joining the military. The thing about the SAS, that's a joke. If you know, that's the British military. Special forces are called the SAS. They're very well known. So that there's a joke Saturdays and Sundays, you know. It's a nice little joke for people who know. Um, but it's new, right? They don't have that type of culture of volunteer. They, they haven't had to deal with things like this, but they're, they're taking it seriously because you can literally throw a rock into the Rus uh, Russian Federation, which is the nation that's threatening them. I have a map later on to show you why those countries might be worried. Um, the other thing to keep in mind with Estonia, Latvia, Finland, uh, all the Russian media is very, I mean, they have a land, right? So all the Russian media signals are very easily picked up in Estonia, Finland, and all those Baltic states. They get the propaganda from Russia. A lot of them are Russian speaking, might be Russian ethnically. So it's very easy to understand why they would be siding or at least sensitive to what Russia is saying because they're getting the propaganda. They're at least somewhat able to identify with the population. Yeah. So I think, uh, yeah, um, I don't know if I don't, I honestly don't know if he's fired him yet. Um, he might have, but Basically, the architect of the military and, and you know, uh, the counteroffensive. And so Zelensky blames him for the counteroffensive not being uh, successful. Um, he is the one that came out and said, we, we are at a stalemate. Like the First World War, we should be negotiating. It's not worth um, the loss of the people and, and et cetera. Um, there are theories about why they're publicly debating each other. There are theories that the general wants to run for president. Uh, obviously, Zelensky doesn't want that. Um, I guess he still wants, you know, and, you know, there aren't any elections coming up necessarily, but, you know, uh, that debate is going on. So Zelensky blames him. He's kind of blaming Zelensky at this point. And at some point, I mean, it's reasonable to understand Zelensky will have a staff shot. You know, you just need to shuffle your cabinet every now and then to get fresh perspectives and doing different things. Uh, but again, you know, they're not, um, they can't escape politics just because they're at war and they're fighting for their survival. Politics will always exist. There are people with different opinions and those two people clearly have different opinions on how to proceed. And then this is another video that's important, again, that directly addresses the Ukrainian resolve. 
But next, uh, when Russia launched its invasion of Ukraine, volunteer fighters rushed to the front line to defend their country. A whole nation was mobilized and Western aid and weapons poured in. Now, two years on, the headlines have switched to talk of frozen funding, ammunition shortages and problems recruiting soldiers. For Ukraine, the goal of liberating its territory hasn't changed. But as our Eastern Europe correspondent Sarah Rainsford now reports, the price is having to pay is rising all the time. These are the patrols many Ukrainian men now dread. Conscription officers like Pavlo hunting for draft dodgers. Ukraine needs a lot more soldiers, but they're not flooding to the front lines anymore. So some have to be caught and cajoled. Pavlo lost his arm near Bakhmut in a mortar attack. But he wanted to go on serving his country. So now he looks for other men who can still fight. There's a full-scale war, but it's still like people don't care. We need everyone to come together, like they did on the first day. Everyone was united then, like brothers. But when I ask about friends who've served with him, Pavlo tells me there's almost no one left from his company. Everyone's either injured like me or dead. When the Russians occupied Lilia's town, her son was captured and tortured. When Serhi escaped, he signed up to fight for Ukraine. He's now been badly injured, but his mother's afraid he'll recover and go back to the front. Serhi says his friends there need him. While he is in hospital, I can sleep calmly. When he is on the front line, I can't sleep. So I really shouldn't say this. I'm glad he is not there at the front. Every Ukrainian town now has cemeteries like this, filled with the soldiers honored by their country as heroes and mourned deeply by their families. Vladislav was killed by a mine near Bakhmut. He was 22. Ina hasn't put his photo on the grave yet because she can't quite accept her only son has gone. But she's proud of him. I believe my son died doing the right thing. When I ask about those who avoid signing up, Ina doesn't judge them. Do you think my son wasn't afraid? I was afraid too when he went. Everyone is afraid of dying. But maybe being enslaved by Russia is scarier. She calls it a fight to protect Ukraine's freedom. But the cost is growing. Sarah Rainsford, BBC News, Cherkasy. So, you know, it, there was a very clear difference initially when people were signing up. Um, the first video also mentioned there are 10 million refugees from Ukraine, so not as many people are in Ukraine as there used to be, so that's a factor. Uh, you know, you can theorize about why people aren't signing up. Um, a lot of different theories, but we don't really know. So it's important to know Ukraine is under martial law, that's why soldiers are going around if they see a male of conscription age, that's why it gives them the authority to ask if they've been drafted and if, if they're showing up and perhaps even take them right then and there and, and you know make them report it um so why should we care there's some obvious answers here um and of course these are uniformly across the board other conflicts through a lot of civilian casualties here um 10 million refugees that's the biggest, the largest since the First World War. Uh, instability is pretty bad for us. It's not bad for Putin. Um, it's not bad for dictators, but it is bad for people who like the status quo. Uh, disruption to the world's food and energy supplies, you know, energy supply is still a factor. Uh, Rules-based international order, you know, there's a reason why we put these rules in order is to minimize civilian casualties and war and people talking to each other, that's really being tested now. And I don't think this is the last year that it's gonna be tested. 
it is setting a, why we should care, it's setting a good precedent for dictators. So if we don't have the resolve to fight this, uh, dictators are taking note. <clears throat> Iran might, you know, make incursions of their own. Um, uh, China might make incursions of their own, and we're constantly talking about whether they're going to attack Taiwan. If we don't have the resolve to stand by these conditions, are we going to have the resolve to stand in the unity? Um, and then, you know, if you look at history, history predicts terrible consequences of an action in these types of uh, scenarios. Um, it's almost an identical situation between Hitler, Nazi Germany, and how he started his mass invasion. Now, everybody knows how that ended up. We look back on it and we say, why didn't we do something earlier? Um, and Ken Burns had a great documentary about the Holocaust. And even someone who studies history like me didn't realize how many opportunities we were given before Pearl Harbor to um, challenge Hitler and we didn't. And same thing for Europe. So, I mean, this is, all you have to do is kind of change German to Russian, right? Um, this is a Hitler quote. Uh, I must also declare before the German people that in the Sudan German pro that the Sudan Sudan -ten German problem, um, my patience is now at an end. Uh, give the Germans their freedom, or we will get this freedom for ourselves. So this is basically Putin saying the Russian people in Ukraine are being threatened; their freedom is taken away. You either give them their freedom, or I'm gonna free them myself. So he invaded basically Ukraine in the same exact pretext that Hitler used to invade uh, Czechoslovakia and then to annex Austria. He was setting the German ethnic people free. Um, and our adversaries, and even our, our allies specifically, right, are watching. So it's not just China, the DPRK, and Iran. NATO is watching. Anytime we enter into a treaty now, we're being judged whether we're going to fulfill our treaty obligations or not. So this is a great reason to care. Um, and again, if you look at what isolationists said back in the 40s and the 30s, it is almost exactly the same language. And I'm talking exact same language to the words, two words, America first. That is not the first time we use that type of language and slogans. And that is being you know, uh, put forward as a reason not to intervene in Ukraine or Russia or the other countries. So, you know, we'll, we'll, nationalists are favoring Putin even. I'm not going to say who it was that just went to, uh, to Russia and interviewed Putin. But, you know, that type of person unbelievably favors Putin over elected officials in the United States. Uh, it's the same thing about Hitler. Uh, we had great American patriots who favored Hitler, who were isolationists. And I'll give you a hint. He was a famous pilot um, who FDR, actually, there's an FDR quote that if I were to die tomorrow, uh, I can't remember his name. Lindbergh. Charles Lindbergh. Yeah, I know that I know I would be happy uh, dying. Happy to know that I am 100% sure that Charles Lindbergh is a Nazi because he defended not invading, not helping the Jews, not interfering with Europe that much. The current one, Tucker Carlson. Tucker Carlson. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, you know, Yeah, so, you know, it's, I can, I can say what I, you know, I can talk about Tucker Carlson's actions. You know, he just, he, I'm saying he went and he said specific. As, as an academic, I can't fully tell you what Trump is going to do. Trump might just be, this is his strategy. And then as soon as, you know, he's elected, he might be like, I'm going to nuke Putin. And, and he'll see, you know, what Putin does. So, you know. Who knows? Um, depends on his advisors, depends on the time, a lot, a lot of different factors. 
Um, and we're seeing this now, the last bullet. Some in the West are blaming the West for causing this, like NATO expanded too quickly. I don't think NATO expanded too quickly. If anything, in 2019, you probably could have made the argument that, hey, we could just disband NATO. I mean, if there was a serious vote in NATO countries, I think a lot of them would have voted on a popular vote to say, yeah, we don't need NATO anymore because you know the threat doesn't exist. So Putin put this in perspective. He proved that there is a threat and that's why now NATO is expanding. So the future, I'll talk about this real quickly. Um, I can't answer this. You have a question? Oh. Yes, he did. Yeah. Yes, early 2000s, he wanted to join NATO. Yes, so Ukraine wants to join NATO to have the defense guarantee. The theory is that if you're a part of NATO, we will all help. I can't say that for certain, right? That is what the paper says. Oh, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. And, and well, he did. I mean, this is early 2000s, you know, and it wasn't, it didn't go very, you know, Americans were like, no, you're, Russia is basically the reason NATO exists. It's not a good time. And of course, you know, maybe he was insulted again. Who knows? So many nuances. Um, but yeah. And then, of course, remember, you can't just join NATO, even by just a vote. Every country has to ratify your entry. And you have to meet certain criteria. So you have to have certain things in place for corruption and, you know, democracy and things like that. So we can't just let in a dictator. And you know, some, you would argue, they got in a long time ago, you know, like Hungary is very questionable. Um, but, you know, it's, it's different coming in. So it's not just like, yeah, come on in, you know, Russia, no problem. They would have had to meet a lot of criteria and then get votes. I mean, every legislator in those countries would have to ratify and let them into the treaty. So it's not that easy. So questions for the future. I pretty much don't have any answers for any of these, just things to think about. Uh, will Ukraine continue to be supported? Will Europe and NATO remain strong and uh, committed to defense? No. If there is a treaty, will Russia be used as an example? Um, so there's uh, deterrence, basically. So is Putin going to come to the table, get a negotiation, get a ceasefire, keep the territory, and then we're going to restore and take away all sanctions and all is good for Putin? What kind of message will that send to other dictators? That could happen. It just depends on how much resolve we have. Um, and again, we live in a democracy. So one person is not making this decision. Many people are making this decision. Um, and will Ukraine win the peace? So uh, there's a good video on this, but once this is over again, will reconstruction set Ukraine up and make it a new vibrant country, basically? And there's a lot of investment capital in the world that's just waiting uh, for this scenario where they can go in and help build, re rebuild Ukraine. So good questions to ask. This is, I'm not gonna play this for time, um, so the options, we've kind of hinted at them. Item D is a new one that I've added because since the six months ago when we did this. So uh, option A is no treaty until Russia is expelled. That's what Zelensky has said publicly. Probably not very likely uh, at this point. Uh, two is keep fighting both sides and uh, improve Ukraine or Russia's negotiation position at the table. Um, and I would argue at this point, Russia is, has a uh, stronger negotiating uh, stance. Um, we can start treating on negotiations right now. Uh, I don't see that happening either. And then item D, this is the new one, because based on what we're seeing in Congress and elected or perhaps soon to be elected leaders are saying, uh, there might be further incursions by Russia. So that's the same map we're looking at. Russia's in a pretty strong position. I don't think they would want to negotiate right now. 
they probably can put themselves in a stronger negotiating power. They're going to wait at least until November to see how things are going to go. Um, this is item D. So if you look at a map, you know, there is this part where Kaliningrad is, is Russian territory, 100% not debated. It's separated by Poland and Lithuania. So possibly, you know, again, if someone says, maybe I won't support NATO countries who aren't contributing an X amount, which is a false premise, by the way, um, into NATO. Um, okay, so maybe that's say, an interesting position for Putin. It's like, okay, well, maybe I'll test that. Maybe I'll launch attacks from this side, Russia, um, to into Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, and see, you know, if they're going to be able to stand on their own, or if the United States is and England and other countries will come to the rescue. They are in a pretty, they are in a stronger position to do that, Russia, Putin is, than any other time in history. Not going back, obviously, before uh, you know the start of the Cold War. So when we say, why should we care? I mean, this could, it's not, it's no longer, six months ago, I would have said, no, let's not even talk about this, but now it's possible. Um, so it's another, you know, another uh, point to think about. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Yep. So, mm -hmm. so the theory is, I don't think they're necessarily safer. I think the theory is, and, and you know, Putin might just want to go to Finland also. But the theory is if he goes here, you'll have access to the Baltic Sea and the Gulf of Riga. Again, think about land, resources, things like that. He might also just want to reunite Kaliningrad with Belarus and Russia. That's the only reason this specific, you know, theory is put out. That just for the heck of it, he wants to see all of Russia. You know, he has the, his land bridge to Crimea. Now he wants his land bridge to Kaliningrad. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, so at this point, I don't think so. I don't think there are any, you know, I, again, at least until November, I don't see any action like that happening. It could happen in the future. It's possible. Again, it depends on, is Putin going to be under enough pressure? You're talking about the cost. There were costs to maintaining Crimea, too. And that was one of the reasons. You know, they built a bridge from Russia, like a sea bridge, to Crimea. The land bridge, way cheaper, right? So now he's achieved that objective. So very, very likely. And as far as the Baltic Sea being off limits, so Sweden's not in NATO yet. Right. Um, you know, but that doesn't mean they won't step in, you know, because obviously they're right there. But again, it depends. If he does it, will they be challenged? And will they be challenged significantly enough? And will the US be part of that challenge? Or, you know, and again, for, for a dictator of any country, there is less risk in taking risks. You know, you can afford to, you don't have to think about your next election. Right. So, yeah, that, it's a good point. I'm very, it would be very interesting. I mean, you know, things, things shape up in weird ways. And that could be part of the treaty negotiations. You know, if Russia is in a very weak point, they might demand that they let go of Kaliningrad. Uh, mm hmm.
Kharkiv? Oh, no, no, south. Okay. Right next to, mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, the Kiev Azov and then Black Sea. Uh, Kherson. Right. Yeah, yeah there, there was like a dam that got uh, mm -hmm. broke up there that basically was just broke down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, they're so one of the things that the Ukrainians have done is uh, they've gone after the fleet, the Russian fleet in the Black Sea, which obviously, you know, false sea here. Um, so that's how, you know, Crimea was being supported. The Ukrainians did start going after, and this is when they had more money and weapons. They did start having special forces strikes and missile strikes on points to try to choke it off. Now, they don't have as many resources. Um, they're still doing it little by little. But I mean, this is like, I mean, uh, yeah. And of course, by starving, I mean, I don't think, you know, they're going to literally be starving, right? It's going to be some type of, you know, just Putin's forces can't get to Crimea and then put them in a poor strategic position. Yeah, reinforcements. Now that certainly was, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, but you know, remember, now he has this front too. So it's not, you know, going to be as effective. But Crimea is very, very important to Putin because the Black Sea fleet launches and it was based out of Crimea. That was the whole reason for annex again in 2014. Not because the Crimeans asked Putin to do it, you know, he just didn't want to have uh, basically, you know, the Ukrainians wanted to be closer to NATO. Putin said, "Oh no, Crimea is in, is, is way too strategically important to me. I'm going to take it." Back. Absolutely, yeah. Keep going. Why not? Uh, the other. Yeah, um, so on the last one, uh, I don't know where Ukraine would get more people, right? When it started, every, every type of Ukrainian from all over countries around the world went back to Ukraine. People were, were ethnically Ukrainian that never, you know, their parents were Ukrainian, felt obligated to go back. That's pretty much it. Uh, Russia's population, I think, is five times larger, I think, maybe more, uh, larger than Ukraine. And where Russia is getting its soldiers now, um, or fighters, they're tapping prisons, they're tapping foreign fighters. Uh, they're also tapping, I mean, Russia is very big. So they're not getting their fighters from Moscow or St. Petersburg. They're getting it from remote places, you know. So, um, and they're telling people either they have to, you know, be conscripted, they're promising them things and 
you know, generally for people, you know, more likely to be conscripted. Uh, so, you know, how long can they hold out? Not very long. I mean, that is a major factor, I think. And kind of disappointed in Ukraine because, because they're kind of lowering their death tolls a little bit when it comes from Ukraine. And I think maybe he said, uh, Zelensky said 30,000 when the U.S. estimate is like 70,000 deaths. Um, so not a huge fan of that um, type of, you know, but again, like, you know, is someone going to correct them in Ukraine? Probably not. So, yeah, it's it's not an, a, a, a position that Ukraine can continue to go with, both with armor. Now, with armaments, uh, to truly answer that, I would have to have what, access to a lot more information than I have access, right? Why didn't we give everything to Ukraine immediately? There is the diplomatic, they don't, we don't want to ask. But there could also be a logistics. It's possible that, like you said, it takes a long time to train people. And also, maybe we didn't have them. You know, maybe it needed to go through production and we didn't say we didn't have them because that's a strategic risk to say we don't have this stockpile. We don't want our adversaries to know. So they had to be manufactured. Um, as far as training now, I have a feeling, again, I don't know, but if it was me, before they were authorized to, you know, get these weapons, you could have trained people on them already, right? Maybe, I don't know, you know? Government doesn't work logically, and there could be bans against them. Um, and then, you know, obviously, um, like attackums and HIMARS and stuff, there are political debates about sending them, but maybe we needed to manufacture those. Maybe we need to keep a certain stockpile for ourselves. Maybe our capacity isn't there, maybe it is. I, don't have the information. The other thing that's kind of overlooked, especially by people saying we should just stay out, we shouldn't give 80 billion or 60 billion dollars to Ukraine. I've heard estimates up to 80% of the money we're giving to Ukraine is actually spent in the United States. Because we're not giving 80, 60 billion dollars to Ukraine and they're going to go shopping for weapons. Yeah, they're going to buy it from American names. So the money is staying here. It's, it's a boom to that industry. So if you're against that industry, you know, you can make that argument, but it's not like we're giving Ukrainians money and they're gonna be spending it on vacations. It's, we're giving American executives money so they can spend it on, uh, you know. So it's, it's often overlooked by opponents of, of giving people money. Oh, time, yep. So, uh, you know, how can ordinary Americans help? Um, you know, I don't know how much donating will, you know, help. I think the amount of money that we can contribute doesn't, but you know, there are organizations out there being vocal to elected officials uh, and being aware. So I'm actually doing a presentation a few times this year in Homeland Security settings, where I'm gonna be talking about cybersecurity and disinformation attacks, specifically from Russia. Um, they're going to increase as we get closer to election. So it's very important to be aware of those disinformation and then misinformation campaigns uh, because their number one goal is to impact the election. And there is, I mean, I would argue that Putin wants Trump to get elected. China wants Biden to get elected. You know, there's a difference between status quo and not status quo. So, you know, again, we can debate that, lots of nuances, but uh, just being aware of these campaigns is very, very important and arguably the most important thing you can do. And of course, showing up to discussions like this, exchanging ideas, always great. Um, 